This is the Word Incarnate, a podcast project of the Wandering Ranger. The following podcast is a production of The Wandering Ranger. If you would like more information about this podcast and other relatable information, please visit www.thewanderingranger.com. In this episode of The Word Incarnate, we are taking from Ephesians 2, So, we're going to do most of the book of Ephesians 2 and go from there. So, let's start with the first verse. And you were dead in trespasses and sins. It's important to understand that this show, what we're going to be doing, is looking at how the word incarnate is a reality. How the word becomes incarnate. Last time we talked about how the word was made flesh that Christ's word became that God's word became Christ itself that God and his word are inseparable and that God became incarnate for our benefit and therefore the importance of relating the incarnate word the presence of God in flesh form and and understand what it truly means to take on flesh to truly flesh out, no pun intended, kind of, kind of like pun intended, uh, to flesh out what that means. To understand how God connects us to him through his word, through his uh, sacraments, and how this is best done through liturgy. Uh, just a slight note before we start really getting into the depth of this um, <clears throat> you can find information about this uh, on my website at the www.wanderingranger.com and I've decided to go ahead and uh, shut down my other uh, uh, YouTube channel and, and post these directly to the Wandering Ranger I kind of last time had told you guys that I had had um, questions about how I was going to do this, and I kind of had my hand forced when uh, I tried to upload the first episode of the podcast to YouTube, and uh, found found it uh, not to work. So I don't know what it is about that account, uh, but I posted it to my Wandering Ranger account without any problems. So I don't know what's going on there. It was not the file. It wasn't corrupted. It wasn't anything. So uh, for the time being. I will I will give you connections to some of the videos I've already established there. I'm just not going to continue to put videos on there. Um, and I'm going to put everything uh, for a page directly to this. So um, so this is connected to my, my side project I was doing called The Liturgical Apologist. Um, and I might rework that, rename that. At this point, I don't know. I just know that I want to create this content for you now. Um, because, uh, you know, I have the time and I want to focus on this going forward uh, as part of the overall thing I want to talk about. So, for those who are not familiar or those who are new to the show, one of the things I'm doing is I'm actually going to be looking at how the Word connects to liturgy and how the liturgy is the Word. And if you have good liturgy, it's actually the Word made flesh. So the Word of God is living through liturgy. Uh, And especially if you have a very good biblically centered, and I would even go as far as to say predominantly traditional liturgy is going to be the best vehicle to get that. Not to say that contemporary or... uh, what I now call neo-contemporary worship doesn't provide b- biblical 
but the emphasis is more on kind of uh, making it your own rather than focusing it on the Word of God. And if that offends anybody, I'm sorry. It's just the truth. It's just fundamentally the truth. So a couple of things to note. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to actually be going through the Bible as we uh, tackle each episode. So everything I do will be first and foremost based in Scripture. So if you come to this and you're looking at uh, the wording and you're seeing the artwork and you're hearing me use doctrinal statements uh, and uh, language to define certain things, if I'm talking about the liturgy and it seems to be almost kind of like too Catholic for your taste, and if you think I'm Catholic, I'm not, not in the sense you think probably, I'm not Roman Catholic, um, but, you know, I also want to make it important that you understand that everything that we do in this podcast is breathed in through the Word of God. So, we're going to be mostly dealing with Ephesians 2 and then going out of that into some related texts. So, as we started with the first verse, and you were dead in your trespasses and your sins. We're dead in our trespasses and sins, meaning we as mankind are dead. Now, it's important that we understand what Paul is telling us. He's telling us not that we're injured, not that we're asleep, although sleep is very connected to death, but that we're dead. And think about that for just a minute. What does it mean to be dead? We're dead in our sins, meaning it's we're dead. We're, we have no life in us. Therefore, there's nothing that connects us. Nothing in ourselves that connects us to God. Nothing in ourselves that brings about life. Nothing in ourselves that provides anything good. And if you're going to get into the Word of God, if you're going to really devote yourself to having a good biblical basis for your faith, you have to understand this as the importance. And St. Paul is stressing this in this chapter of Ephesians, that we're dead in our trespasses and sins. He continues in the second verse, in which you were once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of power of air, and the spirit that is all now in the work in the sons of disobedience. Going into the third verse, among whom we all lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Now he is talking, of course, and we're going to find out, because who he's talking to, the church of Ephesus, he's talking to people who are mostly coming from the Gentile uh uh, uh, background. They're talking to people who were not of the Jewish faith, who were not of the promised. Um, he's talking about people, but he's not just talking about, you know, just one particular group of Gentiles. He really is talking about all of us. Here we see that all, all of mankind was dead in our sins. We belonged to the power of the air. We're just talking about Satan. We lived under the spirit that is at work in the dis sons of disobedience among whom we lived in the passions of our flesh. We see here, and Paul will, will continue to make this an indicative statement, that we were slaves to our sin. We were slaves to our disobedience. We were slaves in unrighteousness, meaning that we were victims to our flesh. We were born into a flesh that was not holy. We were born into a flesh that was uh, not just, you know, uh, uttered in darkness, but it is dead, dead flesh. Now, he's going to connect this to circumcision, and it's important that you understand the importance of circumcision plays in this through a biblical lens. If you look at circumcision from most perspectives, circumcision doesn't make sense, and it almost seems almost barbaric. And circumcision outside of the spiritual aspect of it most certainly is. You remember that circumcision was an outward sign that God's people, the, the people of Israel, did. It was a ceremonial cutting away of flesh that represented that they were not of the same flesh of everybody else, that they were set apart, that that flesh had been taken out. And the importance, of course, of that circumcision and giving it to a child once they're a baby boy once they're born is very important. Because if you're a baby boy and you're circumcised, you don't choose to be circumcised. It's done for you. It's cut away for you. And so Israel, it's important to understand that their covenant with God 
was never going to be based on them or or be, be based on what they did for God. It was always going to be based first and foremost by God's decree, by God's will. And it's important that once we see where, where Paul is coming at, talking about how God is now going to incorporate the rest of the world into that same promise, that people don't start to confuse the fact that God's covenant with his people is never based upon their desire or their intent. But in fact, that he has to first and foremost do the work for us. He has to take away the flesh. He has to take away our flesh and put on a new flesh. And this is important when you understand what biblical circumcision looks like. Most of the time now, it's kind of held as a custom where it's done uh, more of a, as a from a traditional standpoint of doing it for the sake of cleansing the child, but not understanding or lacking the understanding that it is, of course, the work of God's covenant to his people, that co circumcision was a covenant that God established with his people Israel. And that understanding the importance and the impetus of that covenant was that God was going to remove that flesh from you. And the reason why is because that flesh, our old flesh, our old Adam, is sinful, it is destructive, it is bound to our our weakened flesh, our original flesh, which is sin, which is born into sin. Going back into the fourth verse, but God being rich in mercy because of the great love which he loved us, even while we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved. This is the point. It is through the work of God, it is through God's complete 100% grace, which has nothing to do with us, that we are saved. And it's the same with the covenant that he established with Israel. He established the idea and understanding that because he chose them in the first place to, to make this covenant, and therefore the covenant also is represented with the understanding that, some, that a child, which is helpless, is unable to do the, the, the act of taking away its old flesh, then relies upon this covenant. And therefore, we should have an understanding that God is telling us that we have to radically rely upon him to save us, which he has, thankfully. Sixth verse, and raised up with him and seated with us in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show us immensurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, for it is a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Again, Anyone who boasts of their work, anyone who puts the importance on their dedication, on their work, on what they've done for God, and not what God has done for them, and not understanding that it is radically by the grace of God that we are saved, that it is radically by the will of God that we are removing, that we've removed our flesh, that our flesh, you know, it's kind of weird when we talk about how do we remove the flesh, and, and you talk about this to people who are mostly Protestant, and you ask them, how do we deny the flesh and, and put on the spirit? Because this is something that Paul will go into in other books and in other places. And, of course, their first reaction is that, well, we have to deny ourselves. And that's true. There is an element of denying our, our, our sinful nature by, you know, doing things sometimes like fasting. But fasting should only be done not as a, our own work of righteousness, but as a reminder that without God we radically have nothing and that we that we live on God. And so even if we deny ourselves the things that we do, in fact, fasting should be the thing that 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 separates us from our, our work righteousness and our uh, obs obsession with trying to do it all, right? And in fact, when you fast, you're radically relying on God to get you through the day, not your own decision to make your food, not your decision to, you know, listen to your stomach or whatever. But, however, a lot of people can confound that, and they get confused about what fasting is. They get confused about what works of sanctification are, and they confuse them for works of justification. And this is not good. It's important that we understand that it is the grace of God that provides all things, and that grace is vital 
for everything that happens. We do not do it. We, and so in order to understand how we take that we deny the flesh, we have to say that it is a course without the work of God, without the grace of God, that we cannot deny the flesh of our old Adam. Because in Christ we put on a new flesh. In Christ we have been made new creations in Christ. In fact, if we go to uh, into Second uh, Corinthians five, we have an understanding of this, starting with the fifth chapter. Uh, in or so this is Second Corinthians chapter five. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed. We have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by our human hands. Again, it's not done by our work. We do not provide the new creation in Christ. We don't provide that faith. We don't provide that holiness. We don't, we don't create within ourselves that ability to do it. Because when we are clothed, which is interesting, when we are clothed, meaning the importance of that verse is understanding that when clothing is put upon us, we will not be found naked. For we who are in his t in this tent, we groan in our burden because we do not wish to be unclothed, but to be clothed instead with our heavenly dwelling, so that is the mortal may be swallowed up by life. Now this is talking about what it's 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 understanding that for the Christian who has been given the new creation in Christ, they are, they are they have this new spirit of truth and faith. That new spirit of truth and faith wallows in. The fact that its body, that the body is still connected to the old Adam, that our sinful flesh is still a part of us, and that until the day we die, we're not going to be completely removed of that. So part of of us acknowledging that and, and, and kind of being dismayed by, uh, you know, all these sometimes these, these sins that we struggle with, the importance is not that we do this so that we can make ourselves feel holy or that we make ourselves feel like we're doing something but rather we start acknowledging that that we have been clothed in Christ and we've been given a new body and we will be given a new complete body after this side of heaven basically after after our deaths whether it come in 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 the next couple of days or years or whether it comes after the second coming of Christ we will be given new bodies and that will be the completion of God's sanctification for us. It will be the completion of God's a new creation in us. And so, therefore, we have to await that time in which we are given the new body. But until then, we are clothed in his righteousness by his flesh, by us putting on his flesh, by us putting on Christ in our lives. This means coming to, to, to God's word, readily reading his word, Letting it come into our hearts, in our minds, letting ourselves go to church, receiving the, the, the body and blood of Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and for the sanctification uh, for your benefit. So we have to have these new clothes. And in this life, we al allow Christ to clothe us in him, in the new spirit, in, or in us, in the new flesh, in the, new, in, the, in the spirit. And that is what it means for us to put on to put away our old flesh in the new spirit. It has nothing to do with our righteousness. It has nothing to do with our works. It has nothing to do with what we're doing. Rather, what God is doing for us. Continuing in 2 Corinthians 5. Now, the one who has fashioned for us this very purpose is God, who has given us the spirit. So, it tells us right there. He's given us the spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. It's our reliance and our faith and our, de and our dependence on God. And he tells us, look, I'm going to give you the Holy Spirit. And while you're here on earth, while you're struggling uh, until the time in which you have that new complete body, until you completely have been rid of sin, I'm going to continually give you the gifts of faith to put on the flesh of Christ, to put on the spirit of Christ, and to remove and, 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 and to help you distance yourself. Now, you're not going to be completely removed of that until this body dies. That, that's, the, the, that's the price of sin, is the wages of, of sin is death. So until we have our sinful body's death, until we have died, we will not be able to fully dawn on the new body, which the new flesh which Christ has made for us. But 
we partake in his flesh, in his word, in his sacraments, in the liturgy, and these things dress us in that righteousness until the time in which we have that completion. Until then, we do, you know, kind of wait, and it is sometimes hard to wait for that, but it is something to understand that will be done in God's time, and we pray that God will do it uh, as soon as possible, but also knowing that God is, has a complete reason for why he waits for things. And usually it's for the benefit of other believers. So along with praying that come Lord Jesus, we should also pray, uh, and also everybody else <laughs> who God wants to bring on the train. You know, like, come on, let's get on the train. People all over the world hop in. You know, there's that song. You know, there's a love train. You know, kind of the, that notion. But anyways... Continuing in 2 Corinthians 5, Therefore, we are always confident and know that as long as we are not in home in the body, we are away from the Lord. That's important to understand. We, as long as the more we focus on our flesh, the more we allow our old Adam to influence us, the more we uh, live in sin, the more we allow the world to persuade us of what is real and what is right and what is true, and not rely on God's word and his grace and his mercy and his love and his wisdom, the more we put on the flesh, the clothing of this world, the more we become stale and lukewarm to what's happening, the more we become less and less awake about what is happening, the more we get more comfortable with our own sin, the more comfortable we get with the, fal the false philosophies of this world, the more danger it is going to be for us. Because we are now in, we're not in home in the Lord, but in home in ourselves. And we don't want to be at home in ourselves. We want to be at home with the Lord. And this is telling us why. In the seventh verse, for we live by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, that I would prefer to be away from the body and at home with the Lord. And this is where fasting comes into play. This is where denying ourselves our our our, our desires is an important thing because when you deny yourselves you're not making yourself holy because of your actions you're just simply asserting the faith that God is giving you that it is better to put on Christ than it is to be in ourselves and you're flexing what the Spirit has given you and it is a benefit to your soul uh, and it reminds you that there is going to be a new body there is going to be a new paradise there is going to be a new home for us and that this world is not our home it is sinful it is uh, decadent it is in darkness it is death and we want to put on the new flesh of Christ we want to put on Christ because we want to focus on that we want to focus on who God is and his wisdom because we know that eventually one of these days he will come back he will bring us home, and we will no longer have these struggles that we have today. This is the importance of bringing the word into the liturgy, and this is the importance of understanding of putting on the flesh of Christ through the terms of, of going and receiving his body and blood, or receiving him in word, receiving and praising and testifying to who he is in church. And I hear so many times, you know, a lot of Christians, and I'm going to keep on ringing this bell, this idea that I don't have to go to church to be a Christian, and it's true, it, it's the work of God that makes you a Christian, not yourself. However, ask yourself, if you don't want to go to church, why is it? And if, that, if it's because you're too busy being at home in yourself, if you're too busy with the trappings of this life to hear the call of God beckoning you to come and receive his body and blood, then it is, without a doubt, a important lesson to learn that that you perhaps are not wanting to take on the Lord. You are not wanting to be clothed in his righteousness because God's people want to be where the Lord is at. And the Lord has promised himself in the liturgy. He's promised himself in the sacrament. He's promised himself where two or more are gathered in his name. And that best guarantee in that best ability to get that is in church continuing in second corinthians so we make it our goal to please him whether we are at home in the body or away from it we must all 
appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Meaning, it is important to understand that our, our, our actions do have consequences. This isn't saying that if you've done sin, that you're not going to go to heaven. It, it's, that's not understanding it at all. But it's important to understand that there are there are implications and there are there are going to be elements of of what we've chosen in our life and the best way to ensure that we receive the full benefit of God's uh, 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 um, his vision and his desires for us both in this world and the next we have to put him on in flesh we have to put his flesh on us and we have to put that means putting his word into our hearts and minds it means taking his body and blood and church it means focusing on his word incarnate and how it has come to us which has come to us through word and sacrament continuing in second corinthians 5 verse 11 since then we know what it is to fear the lord we try to persuade others what we are is plain to God, and I hope that it is also plain to your conscience. We're not trying to commend you, ourselves to you again, but are giving an opportunity to take pride in us so that you can answer those who take pride in what is seen rather than what is in the heart. If we are in, out of mind, as some say, it is for God. If we are in the right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all, and therefore all died. And he died for all. And those who should live no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and raised them again. So from now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we were once regarded in Christ this way, we do no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is God reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them, and as he committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on God, Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that we, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There, there it is right there. Uh, we are the new creation of Christ. This means we're taking on the flesh of Christ. We're taking him on. And therefore we become his ambassadors. And this is the other thing too, the importance of striving not to sin, the importance of not following for uh, worldly wisdom and fads, is that if we call ourselves Christian, we should do as Christ has asked us, not because it gives us, you know, we're doing it for earning our way to heaven. And anyone who thinks that way clearly doesn't understand what God has done for us and is understanding the way in which God works. But rather, it's understanding that because Christ has already put himself through death, he died for our sins, he submitted himself to, 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 to that, we should submit ourselves to Christ. This is the language we see when he talks about marriage. This is the language that we see when he talks about putting on the flesh. So when we are clothed in the righteousness of God, when we put on Christ, we are putting off ourselves. It is the reality. You cannot do, you cannot put on Christ and put on yourselves. And so therefore, to the question of whether or not Christ, you can go to church and not be a Christian, the reality is if you're a Christian, you don't ever dare to think about that point at all. You wouldn't say, why shouldn't I go to church? You would say, when can I go to church again? When can I receive God again in body and blood? In in and in, and in, in in the bread and the wine. When can I see Christ unfolding in the liturgy as I sing those hymns, as I hear the word of God coming through the sermon? Why can I not have that again? <laughs> That's the real way. And so again, if you're struggling with this, I would just give you this bit of of advice. Ask someone that you trust that you know that is a Christian, that, that has shown themselves to be a Christian, not because of their own merit, but because they speak the truth of the Bible, because they have been given this gift of faith through Christ, and ask them. If there's a pastor you know, especially, that would be a very good thing to go see, and ask them, you know, why should I come to church? And hopefully, if you're reading the Word of God, 
it should want to make you wanting to come to church. And if you're not seeing the connection between putting on the new clothes of righteousness of Christ, putting on his flesh, and seeing the connection to the church, seeing the connection to the sacraments, then I would definitely implore you to uh, to to contact me on Twitter, and I would be more than welcome to get on a, a Google Hangout or a Skype or whatever you whatever it is you're choosing to talk about this with you because it is important, and it's important that we understand we connect these things. So, if you do believe that you are putting on the flesh of Christ, if you're putting on Christ's righteousness, then it's his work in you, so it's not your work. That's the first thing to note. The second thing to note is that you don't ever think about things from a worldly point of view. And if you're a Christian who's thinking from a worldly point of view, if you're accepting worldly things, all this is telling me is that you need to get back into the Bible and you need to read your word. Because it is the word which gives us faith. It is the word which shows us the truth. And if you're putting yourself above Christ in any way or form, and it's understandable why it happens, then you that's when you need you know you need church more. When you question whether or not you need church, that's when you need church the most. But let's get back into Ephesians 2 because that's the main uh, heart of the, of the verse for today's podcast. It's important. We're going back in here in the 10th verse, or excuse me, 8th verse. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of our work, so that no one may boast. But we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand, and we should walk in them. So we should walk in the works of God. We should walk in the ways of which God has pre prepared for us. And that includes going to church. Therefore remember that one, at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision, going back to circumcision, guys, by which is called circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he may create in himself a new man in the place of two, so making peace and that he may reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. That's the other thing, too. When he makes us the new man, when he makes us the one man in Christ, when he takes our flesh and merges it with his own, because that's what he does, when we take that on, that circumcision, of course, for us Gentiles, it's not the circum act of circumcision as the, as the covenant w which was established for the Jews, that's actually, we we're told, is through baptism. It is through the receiving of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and it's not just a one-time thing either. Uh, if you want to connect yourself to that flesh of Christ, because his word is flesh, and the word was made flesh, uh, we know that in the word of God, we are connected to that again. So I implore you guys to read this and to read your Bible more regularly. Get involved in your Bible. Find a good Bible study group. Find a couple of good people you can connect to. And 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 if you are diligently and, and letting the Bible define itself and not trying to put something into the Bible that's not there, you are going to be given the benefit and the peace and the gl grace that comes from putting on God's flesh because it is his flesh but it's important to understand that what he's saying here is that he kills the hostility and so if you're finding yourself to be hostile if you're finding yourself to be fighting these things and and we're talking about division here and understanding that usually division doesn't come from god it comes from man and it's usually us fighting God's flesh. It's us wanting to put our own flesh on or put our flesh over God. It's putting the old Adam over Christ. 
So every time you see a fight in church, that isn't the result of church. A lot of people say, well, there's a lot of fighting in church. That means tells me that church isn't a good place for me. Oh, uh, God, you know, God's people have done some really mean things. They've killed in the name of God. That means religion's bad. That all religion's bad. That means Christianity's bad. Like there's a lot of um, judgments and arguments that are made against the Christian faith and against the Christian church that are based on misunderstandings. And it's understandable why that is. But understand this. The people who do those things, they're not doing it on behalf of God. They're doing it on behalf of their own misguided flesh. And it's no different from the reasons why you want to reject going to church as well. It's the same spirit. When you want to put your own uh, wisdom and reasoning over God, it's the same thing. So if you think that you're not different than the, those people who you're criticizing, think again. Because God shows us that uh, in, if we take on his flesh, we take on his word, we take on his sacraments, and we live to strive by what he has told us, if we, if we live not at home in ourselves, as Paul said in, that, in the Second Corinthians, which we just read from, but if we put on Christ, those new clothing that new flesh, if we strive to deny our ourselves, we don't have those things, those hostilities, those, you know, we have to struggle with that, of course, but it's because our old Adam is trying to get in the way. Going into the 17th verse, and he came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near, for through him we are both have access to one spirit to the Father. So then you no longer are strangers or aliens, but you are fellow citizens and saints and members of the household of God. Again, the work of God coming to you through the Holy Spirit, making you part of the church, making you part of his family, the one true flesh, built on the foundations of the apostles and the prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. It is in him you are also being built together for a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So it is the work of God that brings us together. It is the work of God that puts on his flesh, that puts on his mercy, puts on his spirit of truth and wisdom through faith, through the receiving of the Holy Spirit. This is why it's understandable that we take the word flesh and understand it, and why I am going to be taking out, you know, I'm going to go again to this pun, I'm going to flesh out the flesh. What's important about understanding this? And understanding that in order for us to be of one spirit, we, that flesh has to be removed. The old Adam has to be purged. That means we have to receive baptism. So if you're a person who believes in Jesus, and thank you for believing in Jesus, if you read your Bible, thank you for reading your Bible, but don't just stop there. Because part of receiving the Holy Spirit and part of becoming part of of the covenant of God and becoming part of that family is to receive him through baptism. It's through baptism that the flesh is removed. That part of the flesh, just like in circumcision, is removed. And it is important that if you have a reason why you don't take your kids to church, if there's a reason why you're not getting your kids baptized or why you yourself haven't been baptized, then I would implore you to go to a church that is very solid and I can make recommendations for you based on f of a, a quick conversation, I would implore you to find a church to receive baptism, a Trinitarian baptism. And I would implore you, if you have questions or if you're really seeking this information out, to come and contact me and I will do everything in my power to help you out. But I would implore you to go to church, be baptized, go and receive the gifts of God which he's given to us through a historical, biblical, traditional liturgy, through the sacraments, receiving God for the benefit of your body and your soul. And I would, I would, I would urge that you would understand this in a fullest sense as possible because it's very easy to not see this, to, to read the words and not see what they're trying to tell us. But we need to put on God, and we put on God through receiving of his faith, to receiving of his grace, and by denying our own wisdom and our own foolishness. And it's hard to see when that is. But if you pray to God, if you are seeking, truly seeking out God, he will come to you because he always comes for those 
who who are his children. But if you have a lot of these excuses, if you have a lot of these reasonings for why you've divorced yourself from church, why you've not allowed yourself to be baptized or your kids to be baptized, then I would I would urge you to seek the truth and to acknowledge and see that this has nothing to do with what God wants, but rather what you want. And if you truly say you love God, if you truly say you want to be a Christian, if you truly say you believe in God, then understand that believing alone is not the point. The, the, the point is that you believe and that you follow God. Until the next time we talk, I want to urge you all a blessing uh, in Christ Jesus and let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, through your Holy Son, Jesus Christ, you have given us life through his death on the cross and by the grace and mercy which he extort, extends to us through your Holy Spirit. O oh Lord, we ask that you would put on your flesh, put on your wisdom and your truth in our hearts and minds and to deny ourselves our own flesh, teaching us how to implore your wisdom over that of our own in the world. Letting us remember that you have incarnately come to this world through your word, through sacrament, and through liturgy to benefit our souls until the time in which you come back and extend us that new body. Give us the wisdom to seek you even in times of trial and success. Amen. This is the Word Incarnate Podcast, and I am your host, the Wandering Ranger. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next time. This is the Word Incarnate, a podcast project of the Wandering Ranger.